Hello everyone, I am Ambrosio and this is John, and Hi. we are Ambrosio and John. Uh, we'll be teaching you a class today on how to make mead with no equipment and no money. I know that uh, when we got started brewing about two years ago now, a little over, uh, we had very little money. We had no idea if brewing was actually for us. We just had this really excited idea about, oh my God, mead and a really cheap source of honey. And we didn't want to spend an ungodly amount of money on equipment because we started looking online and saw how much a, a stainless steel conical fermenter was and thought we're not spending $700 to find out if we need a hobby. Uh, and so we poked around and found this wonderful video that's linked in the uh, in the event page and will be linked into the YouTube description for this video uh, and found a way uh, to start brewing with absolutely nothing. And so we, we went through, we made it, it worked out really well. Um, it got us started in the brewing and then going back looking later, we realized that there was some slight misinformation and we felt like the information wasn't being carried through across. So we've decided to try to teach it again in a different way to provide some slightly different information. So that's what we're doing here today. Um, also to give you a chance uh, for those of you who are doing in live to get some feedback to go back and forth to make it along with us and figure out what might be uh, confusing or what might need further instruction. Uh, so, yes. So we're going to uh, break this down to a few sections. We're going to start with just some preliminary information, the absolute basics you need to, need, uh, need to know so you don't kill yourself. Uh, then Wes here is going to uh, go through the actual production method, what needs to happen to make the mead. Uh, and then after that, um, he's going to take me off the leash and I'm going to tell you everything that I think you might need to know uh, about making mead in the early stages. And for those of you who know me, um, I'm sorry. For those of you who don't know me, you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> it is, now that we've been brewing for two years, ways to improve this very simple process and you know what we know about it now and everything. Yeah, and also just the general understanding of what's happening, why it's happening, why we're doing what we're doing, what that's accomplishing uh, and how else we could augment that or what skips could be stepped with uh, steps could be skipped what skips could be added oh my god it's gonna be a long day uh, <laughs> yeah and so uh, for some slight background uh like i said we've been brewing together for about two years now we haven't done any brewing not together this is a thing that we just do as a pair it's worked out really well that way um because we we complement what each other uh, does well. We have similar ideas of what needs to be done, but we also have very different skill sets. Uh, for instance, uh, I have a very strong technical background. Uh, I have a degree in genetic biology. I've been working for the last four years in a uh, food supplement and dietary supplement industry, um, where I've done everything from actually working the line and doing professional lab work to running supplier chain management and regulatory compliance systems. So when it comes to the actual ingredients and a lot of the science behind it, I have a really strong set behind. But in terms of the actual practical skills, I'm weak at best. Um, Meanwhile, I'm strong. And as you can tell from the belly, know what complements, you know, what tastes complement each other. So we're really good at flavoring stuff afterwards. Yeah, Wes is our, our flavoring specialist and tends to drive my poor impulses home, uh, which does not account for why we have now somewhat influencing, we're the people behind the shrimp mead, which we will tell you if that kills us, or you'll read it in the obituary when that finishes coming out. Um, so if it tells you anything about whether or not you actually wanna to listen to us today, we are brewing shrimp mead. So that's the kind of people we are. Uh, so as for the actual information you need, the number one most important thing, and I cannot stress this enough, is sanitation before we start with anything else. Brewing is not necessarily a dangerous hobby in and of itself, but brewing is taking a thing that you can eat and that other things can eat and leaving it in a dark closet for a year and trusting that whatever comes out the other end is not going to be harmful for you. And the only way to be sure of that with any kind of certainty is to make sure that through every step of the way that your sanitation is on spot, uh, that you understand what risks you're taking with sanitation and why you're taking them 
and that you avoid as many risks as possible. Which, speaking of, I'm going to go wash my hands. Yeah. Yeah, so you should always start by, at the very minimum, washing your hands and washing down your preparation space. Uh, before we set up the video on this, this table, though it might look a little funky, it's all spray paint, uh, I scrubbed it down and sanitized it twice. Uh, the entire work area is completely clean. Um, and the uh, part of the structure of this class and the reason we're using what we're using is we're actually going to be able to skip a lot of the sanitation steps because our equipment is coming pre-sanitized. Uh, so that's going to make this a little bit easier to track early on. So one of the important things to note about sanitation when it comes to brewing is that there is some amount of biological risk in the materials themselves, like there are some mold spores and some bacteria in your base ingredients, but the real problem is you. The things that can grow in what you're brewing that can harm you live on you and in you. And so you are not protecting yourself from this, you're protecting this from yourself. Uh, so just keep that in mind as you go through the steps that it doesn't matter if, say, you get a little honey on your hands. As long as you don't touch inside what you're doing, that's the most important part. If you have problems with hair falling into things or uh, if you feel like you have allergies and you might sneeze, a, a hairnet or a face mask is not necessarily a bad idea just to prevent incidental contamination. Um, as I mentioned before, I work in the, uh, in the industry with a uh, very high... Uh, Oh my God, I can't even speak. Uh, with very high standards on uh, sanitation re uh, regulations. And so our standards are probably way beyond what's actually necessary to keep safe. But um, even with the standards that we've kept, we have actually fallen prey to some bad practices and uh, actually injured ourselves. Like got to the point where we ended up falling ill because we didn't treat a certain ingredient properly and didn't pasteurize it afterwards and then left it too long. We got around back to drinking it. It had molded over and we found out when we were bedridden for two days. Uh, so there is, there is a very real chance that you can cause yourself some amount of minor injury just by not paying attention. And that sounds really scary, but I'll explain in a while why it's actually fairly minor. Uh, but it is important to note that every year there are like two or three people who make a really stupid move and drink something they shouldn't have and end up killing themselves with their homebrew, about two people in the U.S. per year, which, I mean, sharks, even worse. So as long as you're not worried about a shark attack, you shouldn't be worried about drinking your homebrew, as long as you understand you don't, shrimp, uh, you don't swim where you see fins in the water and you don't drink anything that smells like it's going to kill you. Um, so that's the, the be-all, end-all, whatever you do, don't spit in your stuff before you leave it for a year and trust that it's going to come out okay. <laughs> um, that is the absolute most critical. Uh, so the general uh, concept of what we're making today is we're going to be making mead, which is uh, honey and water with yeast fermented. Um, and we're going to be making what's known as a short mead. So we're making a mead with a very low alcohol content. Um, it's going to be in the neighborhood of 3 to 5%. This is going to be highly variable, depending on a whole bunch of factors, which I'll explain in the second half of this class. Um, every batch is going to be completely different because we're not using a lot of strong uh, standardization methods. We're not doing fine measurements. We're not starting off with a, a controlled environment beyond just the fact that it's nothing biological there waiting to kill us. Um, and the ingredients that you're starting with are going to probably end up being different than the ingredients that we're starting with because of the in incredible variable nature of honey. Um, and so do not expect that exactly what we make here today is going to be exactly what you make here today. Um, or even that if you repeat the process as close to the same as you can, that it'll come out the same without some serious controls, which again, I'll explain later on how to refine that down. But because of that, this is going to be a put it in the hands of the yeast and pray that they do you okay. And you try to do right by them and they'll do right by you and hopefully it'll be drinkable. And if you're lucky and you do things well, it'll be absolutely phenomenal. The first mead that we made through this method, uh, it was competition grade. And we won the, won the first competition that we made with the first mead that we made using a water bottle uh, and little bottles of honey and a, a packet of dry yeast which really just kind of made us rock it for more. Yeah, um, that's the other reasons for this class is I know a lot of people are, are curious about whether or not brewing might be right for them or if it'll be a fun hobby. Uh, and making something and have it come out at least half decent uh, 
is one hell of a thrill and will let you know if that dopamine rush you get from, oh my God, this is drinkable and oh my God, people like this thing that I made. And oh my God, people are like coming to our table to try the thing that we made. They're excited about it. that is a major rush. And that's what got us going from, huh, maybe we could brew to uh, competitive brewers who have now dedicated an unreasonable amount of time, money, and uh, space in our house so much to, money. <laughs> to a hobby uh, that we enjoy the absolute hell out of. So now that that preliminary is out of the way, we're going to show you what to do. And for those of you who have read through the, the packet ahead of time and who procured the materials ahead of time, go ahead and make sure that you get everything out and ready and easily available. Uh, we're going to be going through it at a fairly standard pace. If you end up falling behind just a little bit and end up losing track, uh, let us know uh, and we can go back and make sure that the pacing fits for you. We've been doing this for just a little bit, so our pacing might be a little bit accelerated. Uh, compared to how you're feeling going to it for the first time. We, we often get ahead of ourselves and then just, I feel like we're missing something. No, no, we've done it all. It's just getting easier. So yeah. So if things end up falling behind a bit, that's not you, it's us. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to get started. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we're going to be brewing in the actual water bottle today. Um, and so we're going to start by removing about half the water, a little bit more than half the bottle uh, water from the water bottles. So we have a space to work. So I'm going to be pouring this off screen in our sink, which you don't get to see. Yeah. Our camera just doesn't have that wide an angle and it doesn't take much imagination to think of pouring water <laughs> off into something. Yeah. So we're going to be able to do this today in a water bottle because of the high standards required for uh, food and food packaging in the US and most places in the world. Um, we're starting with a container that we know is food safe because there's food in it. Uh, we know is shelf stable because it's stable on the shelf a little bit more. Um, and we know it is not full of anything harmful to us because it's water uh, and it's completely drinkable. So we can just trust from the start that this container is ready and, and waiting for us. And I can't quite see, but the water is poured to about the bottom of this label. Uh, we're using these nice, tall conical top bottles that you can get from HEB uh, for those of you in Texas. For those of you not in Texas or in a spot of Texas that uh, are unfortunately don't have an HEB, you can find something similar. If you can't get the nice conical top PEC clear bottles, you can use something opaque or a little bit odd like a... Uh, they often sell water in bottles that look like milk jugs. Uh, these are fine. They're just a little awkward because liquid ends up in the handle. Um, but just don't use actual milk jugs. The bacteria in the milk are hella dangerous. Uh. So once I've poured about half out, uh, I'm going to start adding a honey. Uh, we're using round rock honey. So this is, this is honey that is very local to our area. This was made less than 15 miles from where we are right now. Um, it's very high quality, has good flavor. Um, it is raw honey, which means it's never been heated above 120 degrees, which means that the enzymes and other components, which we'll talk about later, have not been denatured at all. There is nothing particularly special about this, aside from the fact that it has a slightly different flavor than heavily processed honey. There's nothing wrong with using completely processed honey. You can, you can make this with, with table sugar if you want. It's just going to taste like crap. Uh, so um, the important thing when picking your honey most of is find a honey that you like. You're going to have to eat it later. So if you don't want to eat it before it goes into the bottle, you're not going to want to eat it after it goes in the bottle. Same thing goes for the water choice. Pick water that you like to drink. Uh, if you don't like to drink it now, you won't like to drink it later. If you have tap water that you actually enjoy drinking, you can use that no problem. Uh, if, like us, your tap water comes out cloudy, probably best not to. I know someone who brews with mineral water and he loves it, but it tastes disgusting to me. So they each their own. Yeah. Uh, so this is what's called a wildflower honey, which means that it is uh, honey made from whatever happens to be in the area. Um, I'll go more into detail on honey selection later. But uh, right now, he's just doing a simple, like, pull the label and squeeze in. Uh, for this small amount of honey, that's fine. If you do larger batches, don't do this to yourself. It takes forever. Uh, uh, and the, uh, I had a thing. All right. So um, honey, you'll often see crystallizes a little bit. 
uh, little little bits of, of chunk form, it doesn't move quite as well. That is totally fine. There is nothing wrong with your honey. Uh, all that means is it might be a little harder to get in there. As long as the honey moves, there's no trouble and you don't have to worry about it. The crystals will break apart when they get into the water and you shake them up a bit, so that won't be an issue. If it is too crystallized to move, just heat up some water on the stove uh, to just hot enough that you don't quite want to touch it. Uh, and just set the bottles in there for a little bit and it'll loosen up and everything will go through just fine. In fact, these had crystallized on the bottom before we got to them and that pot over there is from me doing just that off screen uh, just before we started up today. Um, if you end up with not quite enough honey coming out, like if you have a large amount in the set or if it's crystallized a lot, you take some of your second bottle of water here. Which I am gonna do since there's a little bit of honey left in them and you know, yeah. why not? And you just pour that water into the bottle and shake it up a bit to help break the honey out. Um, it's not 100% important to get every single drop out, but when you got, you know, solid three quarter inch inch left at the bottom, and eh, why waste? Oh yeah, another important point: brewing gets messy most of the time. You got a lot of liquids moving around. We think of brewing as a good opportunity to mop our floors. So whenever, whenever the floor gets a little bit dirty, there is a certain question that comes about, of, hey, you want to you put something down? You want to you brew something so we have a, a reason to mop that doesn't feel like monotonous cleaning and like we're atoning for the horrible thing we've just done to the floor? Uh, this method is, is fairly low on it, but we, we do a few different kinds of brewing that end up a little bit more messy. Uh, what do you think? That's good. Maybe. Uh, yeah, I get that one a bit. Mm -hmm. But uh, because we're not doing a heavily controlled on this one, uh, you could you could go more honey and less honey. Doesn't matter. Just all you need is some honey in there. The general rule of thumb when it comes to mead is you want about three pounds of honey per gallon of water or per gallon of final volume. But even that is just a general hand rule. More honey, more sweet, less honey, less sweet, and a little thinner. <laughs> and you can see, as with most things in brewing, it looks kind of gross right now. It's just gonna. Almost everything in brewing looks gross right up until the very, very end. So don't worry, that's normal. So now that that's done, we're gonna go ahead, put the cat back on, shake it up a lot. Yeah. And what we're doing with this is we're helping dissolve that honey into the water. Um, it doesn't matter if 100% of the honey doesn't get dissolved in. At the end, the yeast will eventually get rid of the stuff that's kind of sludged on the bottom. But the more you can get into the water, the more consistent your brew will be. Uh, and the easier it'll be to work with. The other thing that we're doing is, um, I'll get more into detail a little later, but yeasts do really well if they have oxygen in their environment, but alcohol doesn't. Um, and so to get yeast started, it's good to move a lot of alcohol into the solution for them to go through and then let them not have any more once they've made alcohol so you don't ruin your alcohol. So what we're doing is we're oxygenating our, our uh, musk, which is what the, the liquid is called now that we've added honey to it, uh, to give the yeast a more hospital environment from the start. So, yeah. So now we're going to take it back up. And then yeast first or raisins first? Raisins first. So next we're going to be adding raisins to the mix. And we're going to be adding some raisins is, I think, the scientific term for it. General hand wavy of raisins. Yeah, uh, this is an important part. It's going to be really easy to forget and accidentally pour these into your hand first. Remember that your hands are a primary source of contamination. Yeah. And so do your best to pour straight from the box into the bottle. You're looking anywhere in the neighborhood from six to 30 raisins. That's about the range we're talking here. Uh, and these raisins are being added for two primary reasons. One is that they provide a small amount of nutrition for the yeast. Uh, but it is a very small amount, and we'll, we'll get into why we're not adding much in later. Uh, but two is that we're actually be going to getting actually going to be getting uh, tannins from the skins of the grapes, just the same as you get in red wine or anything else that has a lot of grape skin involved in the brew. Uh, and this is going to impact the aging and the flavor of the yeast. So more than anything else, this is for the tannins than uh, the nutrients. All right. So now that those are added, we're going to be adding in the yeast. Okay. 
So the yeast that we're using today is uh, Lalvin D47. Uh, you're going to see it probably right side, uh, backwards for us. I hope it's right side. Uh, this is about a dollar at your local brew store or about a dollar fifty plus shipping online if you're only buying this. Uh, it is a white wine yeast. It's very versatile. Uh, and most importantly, it handles uh, mead well because it doesn't need a lot of nutrients to live and honey is really low in nutrients that yeast needs. On the back of the package, it tells you to add it to some water to activate it, but meh. Yeah, that is... This whole process is kind of meh if you haven't been able to tell. Yeah. So that pack is enough for five gallons of mead. Um, and we have one gallon here. So naturally, we're going to be adding about half a pack because, again, we're kind of hand-waving here. And uh, when it comes to yeast, a little too much is better than a little too little, and a lot too much is a lot better than way too little, um, for reasons I'll get into later. So just go ahead and pour in some yeast until you've got a nice little raft of it building up on the top here. And top it off. Uh, shake it again real quick. To, yeah, so then you're gonna cap back up, shake it again. You're gonna kind of get the yeast mixed into the liquid. And all we're doing there is just making sure that the yeast starts off kind of everywhere so that it starts breeding everywhere rather than having to start from the top and work its way down, which it will do, but it takes forever. Uh, and the yeast aren't very happy with that situation because they're really crowded up top and yeast get really mean when they're two packed in together. They don't like each other. Now that we're done with that, we're going to go ahead and top it back off with some of the water from the second bottle. Yep. You're going to bring it up to about here. You want to leave just a little bit of room for things to work. Uh, so you're not actually going to get a full gallon out of this. We're just using gallon as our as our starting level. Um, and just going to kind of carefully pour it in. Don't worry if you spill. Water's cheap. Uh, and it's easy to mop off the floor. So yeah, just uh, should be perfect right there. And now guess what? We're going to put on the lid and we're going to shake again. And what we're doing this time is just uh, now the uh, there's more water sitting on top of the must than there is actual even blending. So now all you're doing is just making sure that you're ending up with a roughly even density all the way through. And depending on your honey, you may need to shake a lot more or a lot less. This is really mixing really easy. So last yeah. time it was very hard. Yeah, uh, and it's mixing easy today because we had to warm it to break up the, uh, the crystals. Right, so right. warm honey dissolves a lot easier and moves a lot easier. I forgot about that. I was kind of worried. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we made a test batch uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, why not save the water from the first bottle and add it back instead of opening a second bottle? Uh, you totally can. Uh, that is entirely possible. Um, the reason that we have a second bottle in the first place is actually for the aging step, which we'll get to later. Uh, and so eventually this is gonna move from this bottle to this bottle. And if you're going to the grocery store, you might as well pick the bottles up at the same time. Um, so that gives you some room to work with. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's the other thing. Because, uh, yeah, anything that you move that water into has to be sanitary uh, for it to come back. Uh, similarly, if you want to just pour off a little and not have an entire, like, extra gallon to work with, if you have just, like, a couple bottles of the same water, like, we get the same thing for our daily drinking water in 20 ounce bottles, then that works fine too, because those bottles are sanitized too, and you know the source is clean. Now is the fun step that hurts him. Um, yeah. So there are a few things in this that kind of hurt me as a biologist and as a regulator um, and a lab tech. And there's a lot of other things. Uh, there's a lot of this that we kind of hand wave and we kind of work our way there. This part is the one that hurts the most. And this is adding on the airlock. And now you can get a, like an actual purpose-built airlock and sanitize it and whatnot. And you end up with a, a pretty good situation all around. Uh, the, mm -hmm. um, but what we're going to be doing for an airlock is we're going to be using the positive pressure that is generated within the system to manipulate an inherently unsanitary situation and make it safe enough. And I had a little bit of a heart attack just there when I said that. So please understand that this hurts me a little, but this is actually safe. So what we're doing is we're taking a standard party balloon, we're stretching it out to give a little bit of flexibility, and then we're taking a straight needle, or, or sorry, a straight pen or a sewing needle or whatever else, Nice and tiny, smaller the better actually. And we're poking about six three to six holes through the balloon. 
And what this is going to do, uh, and we're going to stretch the base of it over the top of this lid, being very careful not to touch the inside of the lid. On the threads is okay, water won't be touching that. And why we're doing this with a party balloon that hasn't been sanitized and came out of a package that we opened two weeks ago, and I almost dropped on the floor just there, um, is because the yeast is going to be generating a lot of CO2, and that CO2 is going to be pushing up and out, and it's going to create a positive pressure environment. Oh, worked out okay this time. Um, and so as the, uh, yeah, as the air builds up, it's going to push up and out, and the little holes are going to expand just a little bit, and that's when it's going to allow, uh, allow air through. But when the pressure decreases, it's going to collapse a little bit, and those holes will shrink, and it's not going to allow air back in. And so what this means is that atmospheric bacteria will be pushed out and any bacteria or inherent contaminants that come into contact with the inside of this balloon in that brief stretching moment or the poking through will be pushed out as well. The net inflow is very, very small. And by the time you end up with the net inflow, there'll be so much yeast in here that the bacteria won't have anywhere to work because it will be fighting against the sheer amount of yeast involved. Um, which makes the next thing that we're about to do um, a little worse. <laughs> yeah, a little bit worse, but it's still it's still safe, I guarantee it, but it hurts my soul to do. Sometimes the balloon doesn't fit over the threads and it just rips. So the only option you have, get it just a little bit loose and, and now it's full of your bacteria. Yep. And so you just, you blow it up. These, these balloons that we have here are particularly party balloons. I got the cheapest I could get to make a point. These were a dollar for a 20 pack. Um, they stretched poorly. When we made our test batch, we went through four of these balloons before we got them to stick, before we finally broke down and inflated them by mouth. Um, so if you're having trouble with the balloon, don't worry. That's not uncommon. It's just a material to work with, but it's a very cheap material to work with that you might already have around the house, and you don't have to worry too much about sanitizing it. In fact, most sanitizers will weaken the rubber and make it more likely to rupture. Uh, the most important thing is that you don't have this thing break midway through your um, your uh, brewing cycle because then suddenly everything's exposed to air and you have some more problems, especially if you don't find it for a few days. Um, Oddly enough, this time it worked perfectly. And if you give it a little test squeeze, it'll just yeah, you inflate should. a bit and uh, yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah, if you can do that, then things are going well. If you can't do that, well, grab another balloon and try again. and poke that through. Um, again, that, every time I say that, despite the fact that I've said it six times in this conversation at least, it just hurts me inside. But no, from a, a genetic biologist who had a career in making sure that food was safe for human consumption, this is actually okay. Uh, so now we have a properly pitched, uh, it's called pitching, when you add yeast to a liquid. Brewing is full of all sorts of terms that sound completely unnecessary, because you can say uh, liquid, uh, our, our base liquid with yeast in it. But uh, brewing has been around since before recorded history. Uh, people have been doing it for a long ass time, have found all sorts of very specific ways to describe it. And like with sailing, our terminology for dealing with brewing stopped changing at about 1810 for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, so there's all sorts of very specific archaic terminology that's around every part of brewing. Uh, and I'm going to use it as much as possible, not intentionally to be confusing, but because if you've heard me say it the right way once, you know what to Google when you need to figure out what's going on, because everyone else on the brewing forums online or in the instructional sets will say, pitch your yeast into the must, not pour some yeast into your liquid. Um, so now that this has been pitched, uh, what it means more than anything else is dark, regular temperature, and 70 -ish, time. 70-ish degrees is ideal. Yeah. So one of the reasons we used the yeast that we used is uh, not all yeast is created equal. Uh, they have different preferences. They have different ideas. Um, yeah. They totally can care. Uh, they can break down uh, quickly. But the good news is this is only going to be on here for about three weeks at absolute most, maybe four. Uh, and in that time, the breakdown will not be appreciable. Yep, that's, yeah, that's most likely it. That's a, a good explanation of that. Um, 
So the, the degradation of the balloon should not be significant enough to cause a major problem. If you notice any signs of degradation, then just get another balloon ready and flip it out. Or at that point, uh, it'll be a few weeks and at least you might've decided, yeah, this is kind of for me and you'll want to spend four bucks on a proper airline, uh, which we'll get to in a, in, a, in a little bit. But honestly, that's it. Congratulations, you've now made me. No, that you now started me. You now started me, right. So now what has to happen is you're going to give it some dark and some time. You're going to let it go through. Oh, right, that's why I, I got cut off halfway through. Uh, so the yeast that we use is very robust. It likes a very broad temperature range. You can put this on your floor just about anywhere. And as long as you don't have massive temperature spikes throughout the day, uh, then it'll be all right. This uh, D47 likes anywhere from, I think, 62 degrees Fahrenheit to 83. Uh, and brews just fine in each of those. You'll actually end up with a slightly different flavor at each temperature set uh, due to some wonderful fun chemistry, but the, uh, it, it is, you can do just about anything to D47. You can starve it, you can overblood it, you can uh, get it too cold, get it too hot, and it'll just keep on trucking uh, and come out with a really nice flavor at the end. Um, so you're gonna set it aside for a number of weeks and you're just gonna let it be as best you can. It's gonna be really tempting to Try not to. It's going to look gross as hell in those few weeks. And I know that the first time we made this, we looked at it about a weekend and we thought, oh dear God, what the ever loving hell have we done? We saw this deep cloudy mixture. The raisins had gone all sorts of crazy, like goopiness. Everything looked absolutely horrible. And we thought we had bacterial infected because we had blown into these balloons and that this horrible, horrible thing. The raisins looked like rat turds, so it didn't help at all. So what we've done, is about two weeks ago, we went ahead and made another batch. Yes, uh, it, does, it produces an odor, odor while uh, fermenting. While aging, not so much. Uh, but during the ag finished aging process, it'll be more or less sealed off. But doing fermentation, it will produce a very distinct smell of yeast and honey. Uh, this will fill your closet that you put it in or the shelf that you put it on. And if you leave it in an open area, it will fill your house. And it smells wonderful no matter what your spouse or significant other tells you. It is the smell of progress and alcohol. And if you put all your garb in there, then, you know, you're doing them a favor, really. Yeah. Uh, not quite. And I'll get into why in a minute. Oh, sorry. I just realized this might not be coming through on the video. Uh, the question asked was, can you use other dried fruits? And I'll be doing a more in-depth explanation of that in a little bit. So we made this two weeks ago, and now this was made with a different kind of honey. This was made with a mesquite honey and a lot lighter. So uh, that's why it's a bit brighter than the others. You can see the raisins are now floating at the top. And they, they look are, gross. They are covered in goop that is yeast that is glommed onto them. You can see the CO2 bubbles still coming up very faintly in this low resolution image. Uh, you can see all this, this protein and whatnot that's stuck onto the top from a lot of bubbles in the early stages just clinging on. And you can see this little layer of sludge at the bottom forming. Like that's not refraction, that's actual sludge at the bottom. That's excess proteins and dead yeast. All of that is completely normal. This mead is 100% healthy. This is on its way to a very good fermentation. Uh, it's had about two weeks. I suspect it'll be about another two weeks before it's done. And as you can see, your balloon's still inflated, perfect seal. Yeah, uh, it'll be a few days before your balloon fully inflates. Uh, it takes a little while for these to get started. If you got one of these with the handle, you set your balloon on the handle, it'll help it inflate a little easier. If not, you may need to go in every day or so and like push the balloon up and let it open up because it can kink over and get caught. So after you go through all of this and you finally hit the point where you don't see bubbles coming up anymore and your balloon finally deflates, or if you like pinch the balloon and squeeze it and deflate it, And it doesn't like this one's fermenting so fast right now it just popped back up immediately but if it doesn't come back in a day or so then you know you're about done and you it, the fermentation is pretty much on its way down then what you do is you take your second water bottle you pour it completely out and then you transfer your fermented rust into the other bottle and you can do this through a bunch of different ways uh, and the one that we used the first time is a, this is a complex term. We called it pouring, I think was the term. Uh, and this is another one that now after two years of brewing hurts my soul inherently. Because what we'll be doing is we'll be getting all of this wonderful must off of all the sludge at the bottom that if you leave it on it for too long, uh, that sludge tastes like 
old yeast and eventually your whole liquid will taste like old yeast. So whenever it's done, you wanna not let it sit there too long. So you're gonna pour all of that just over into this one, nice and carefully leaving as much sludge behind as possible. And if you're doing that by pouring, what's probably gonna happen is you're gonna reactivate some yeast and it's gonna start fermenting again. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna put another balloon on top of your second one, because uh, if you put the lid on it, um, it's gonna explode. Um, we almost popped a cap on our first one because we didn't know that. Uh, and you're gonna do that until that stops inflating and you're gonna do that again and again until that stops happening. That's why it, if you start around here, you'll probably have around here whenever you're done, just <laughs> because you'll lose some each time. Just it's, a little bit. It's to be expected. Yeah. Uh, there are other methods that you can use. We'll get into that in a bit, but that is the most absolutely simple. You have no money, no equipment, and no patience uh, version of doing that. And eventually when it stops kicking up, when you stop having a balloon inflate every time that you do that uh, and it, it finally kicks through, then you're going to just put the lid back on uh, and you're gonna sit and you're gonna leave it for as long as you possibly can. And then about a month more. Six months is the absolute minimum time you're gonna you want to use with this method. Nine months and you might have something good. After 12 months, you're looking at really good mead. Um, and you're gonna to wanna to do this because Later. Later. <laughs> I, I have a hard time holding that. So after about a year, uh, what you're going to do is you're going to un, uh, unhook it. You're going to pour just a little bit into a glass. You're going to taste it and see if... Uh, oh, we'll get there. Yeah. Uh, you're going to taste it and see if it is in any way palatable. Uh, and if it tastes at all good, you're going to put it in a big pitcher. You're gonna throw it in the fridge, you're gonna invite all your friends over and you're gonna drink it that day or the next day because oxygen will start to ruin it. And from the time that you've done that, you are on a timer. Uh, just like when you open a bottle of wine. The good news is we're making short mead, which means a low ABV, uh, which means that it's going to drink like light beer or lemonade in terms of just uh, the, the amount of alcohol that you take in. It's gonna be really easy to drink and really smooth. It's gonna be light and sweet um, and very flavorful. Uh, it's going to bring out a lot of the flavors of the honey that you put in. It's going to have some complex mouthfeel. Using D47, you're going to have this, the small hints of Chardonnay and almost buttery flavors, and it is going to be heaven. But again, you got about a day and a half. So there are some concerns about exactly how O2 uh, deals with mead, and I can tell you from experience that it affects wine less, I'm sorry, it affects mead less than it affects wine most of the time. But as five gallons of very expensive honey mead in our closet proves, if you accidentally uh, over oxygenate it, say during your bottling process, uh, it doesn't ruin, oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, so the question was, uh, someone has read that O2 has not strong, does not strongly affect mead unlike grape wines and beers. Um, and so the oxygen added to mead uh, tends to oxidize alcohol into ethyl aldehyde, uh, which in mead gives a cardboard flavor. And it'll turn your wonderful bright sweet mead into drinking liquid paper. Um, and we recently ruined five gallons of mead that we had aged for a year and taken darling care of and everything was perfect until it came time to bottle and we accidentally transferred it one too many times and weren't very careful and when we uncorked a bottle the next day we couldn't get through a glass. And so there is some amount of oxidation issues. It won't turn into vinegar but um, yes. All right, cool. So all these questions are going into the stuff that I'm going to lecture on. So the next question was bottling or storing in a growler extended shelf life and that is exactly yes it totally will and I'll explain why in just a minute. Uh, so we're going to start with the main question of uh, plastic. We're going to dial it back. <laughs> leash. I'm on the leash still. <laughs> yeah. So after a year, you're going you're gonna to pour it out, you're going to start with your friends, and that's it. You've made mead. Congratulations, that's mead. I'm going to put this away, and I'm going to take a big breath. <laughs> if y'all have any questions about what y'all's looks like, um... I think the first time we had to decant it, which is just pouring it off like three times. So if y'all have any questions, just 
hit us up on Zoom or on YouTube, I guess this is going to be. Um, and we'll try and help.